Hi folks, I'm Brother Chad with Masters Lanterns Ministries. I want to thank you for tuning into this online Bible study. If you'd like to contact us, our email address is masterslanterns at gmail.com or you can go to our Facebook page and give us a like. Our URL for Facebook is www.facebook.com slash Masters Lanterns Ministries. Um, so I had a special request for this week's Bible study and it's something I've actually been wanting to do for about two years um, but people said and it's something that, that you know I, I really wanted to do because it's something less controversial um, but it's something that's just kind of there and it's something we often look at and some people get downright mean when it comes to dealing with the topic and it's just not right <clears throat> and of course everyone's going to have their opinion on this um, but finally I was asked to do a video on this topic and I brought it up to a couple of the others that assist with Masters Lanterns Ministries and they gave in and they said sure go for it so here I am today we're going to be looking at the topic of the gap theory for those of you who don't know, the gap theory, and notice it's called a theory. Um, the gap theory says that in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. They say between verse 1 and verse 2, there's a gap of time where an entire creation took place Satan fell, the earth came to ruin, and then in verse 2, the earth had to be reconstructed or recreated. Now, for those of you who are into creationism, um, and to be honest, when I started studying creationism, the gap theory is actually what led me into creationism, uh, of all things. Um, I was actually sitting under some teaching at the time that believed the gap theory. And then I was challenged to research it and find some hard evidence for it or against it. So I started doing my research. And what I discovered is that the gap theory is wrong. Um, this is something that has been very divisive in many churches. Uh, it's something that has caused a lot of arguments and animosity between, between Christians. Um, and it's usually not a matter of evidence, but it's more of a matter of preference. How did the gap theory come into existence? Uh, well, first off, it came into existence through poor hermeneutics. For those of you who don't know, hermeneutics is the science and art and practice of interpreting literature. In Christian circles, biblical hermeneutics refers to the science, art, and practice uh, of interpreting scripture. Now, I have studied hermeneutics at length. I went through various uh, classes and courses on it. I have various books on it, as you can see here. Um, and here's just three of the books that I have. Um, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by Gordon Fee which has some really good exercises in it. Basic Bible Interpretation by Dr. Roy Zuck. And the granddaddy of them all, one I got just last year, or no, it was this year for my birthday. Um, Biblical Hermeneutics, a treatise on the interpretation of the Old and New Testaments by Milton S. Terry. This book was originally published in 1884, and to this day, even though it's been 132 years, this is still considered the textbook on hermeneutics. However, it is very old. It is dated, so it's never really been updated. However, this is the classic work on the subject of hermeneutics. And it is still considered by many to be one of the best available. Uh, you can also find a free download of this, if you just go to Google and you type in Biblical Hermeneutics by Milton Terry PDF, you can download a free PDF guide of this book. Well, not a PDF guide, 
a free PDF copy of the book. It's beyond uh, it's beyond uh, copyright laws. So you can freely download it, print it, copy, whatever. I think. I don't know. I know you can freely download it. But anyway, hermeneutics goes to how we read scripture, how we interpret scripture. And the gap theory really is one of, uh, it, it's really a question of hermeneutics. And are we going to use consistent hermeneutics when we read the Bible? Now, uh, I got some straight paper here. There we go. Okay. So first, let's go ahead and look at the history of the gap theory. Now, the gap theory, as I said, starts with Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. But we need to look at the history of when men started interpreting it into Scripture. It all starts with a Dutchman by the name of Episcopius, who was born in 1583 and died in 1643. Though his writings are obscure and spurious to a point, he really was the originator of the gap theory, as far as everything I can tell. Then, in 1814, a Scottish theologian who was born in 1780, died in 1847, whose name was Thomas Chalmers, uh, presented lectures where he planted the seed of what has become the gap theory weed. Uh, during some of his lectures, there was a minister and geologist, scientist, by the name of William Buckland present. Buckland popularized Chalmers' theories uh, regarding the gap theory. Now, the writings of Chalmers uh, give little information about the gap theory. However, we do have quotations from secular scientists of the day, like uh, Hugh Miller, who was a geologist, who quoted extensively from Chalmers on the subject. Now, the most notable author uh, writing books promoting the gap theory was G. H. Pember, who wrote Earth's Earliest Ages in 1884. Oddly enough, that's the same year that Milton Terry's Biblical Hermeneutics came out, so imagine that. Uh, that's just something I just realized. Uh, and it was still being published up until the 1940s. So it had a good, you know, 58 year run or so. Um, or wait a minute. 40, 56 year run. Okay. Now we're in the 20th century. And new, new books have come out, have came out since then. Most notably, uh, is... Without Form and Void by Arthur C. Custance. Now his book, Without Form and Void, is probably the most scholarly and academic of any of the books dealing with this topic, where it is actually promoting the gap theory. Uh, since then, though, there's also been the Schofield Study Bible, which was introduced around 1909, um, and that was pretty much most people's introduction into the idea of the gap theory. Um, and then finally, when Finus Jennings, Je uh, Finus Jennings Dake introduced his uh, Dake Annotated Reference Bible, that gave a primary source for the theory. Um, I was able to borrow a friend of mine. He, he was trying to prove the gap theory to me, and he happened to have an extra Dake study Bible sitting there. He had loaned it to me because I was really on the fence at this time. He was trying to prove the gap theory to me. He loaned me his old worn out Dake Annotated Reference Bible and he had marked a couple pages he wanted me to read. There was like a little mini article, index, whatever you want to call it, about the gap theory just like a couple pages long. It's, you know, it was over 10 years ago. Anyway, he loaned it to me and he said, here, if you read this, you study this, you're going to see the gap theory. And I said, okay. I took it home and I started reading it. And I read the section two or three times. And it started to make a lot of sense. And I'm starting to believe it. And then my mind said, wait a minute. 
You need to check the references. You need to apply proper biblical hermeneutics. Check the contexts. See if all this stuff really goes. And what ended up happening with me was Dake's Annotated Reference Bible, when I started studying properly apart from the guidance of the study Bible, what I discovered was Dake was putting up straw man arguments, as gap theorists do. Um, and I'm not trying to be malicious or anger anyone, but a lot of their arguments are complete straw men, and they're a prime case of what we call eisegesis. And that's a term we use in hermeneutics, which means you're reading into the text something that isn't there, and then bringing it back out to prove your point. What we want to do is exegesis. We start with the text, examine the text, and draw out what is there without reading in any preconceived notions before we draw out information. So once I did that, I realized Dake's annotated reference Bible, of all things, it was that which showed me that the gap theory was wrong. Um, now, <coughs> the question comes up, why do we need the gap theory in the first place? And I would say that probably one of the original starting points for the idea of a gap theory, or at least the thought that allowed for a gap theory to exist, probably comes about from an early church philosopher, theologian, and apologist named Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas was a brilliant man in his own right, and he did a lot which benefited the early church and even the church today. Uh, his writings on philosophy and theology are still very good reading. However, Aquinas came up with this idea, and he promoted it. The idea was simple, and that was that science and the Bible should not conflict. Uh, the science is true, it's observable, it's provable, and there should be no conflicts between science and the Bible, so we should do what we can to make the Bible and science line up. Um, so now what happens is you're putting science on equal par as the Bible. Now that's fine for secular thinking, but for Christian thinking, what you're basically saying is science is equal to greater than God. Because ultimately God is the one who inspired the scripture, so now they should be on equal, equal terms. Um, and that can be a very dangerous thing. So now let's go ahead and let's get into scripture and we are going to look oh I gotta move some books out of the way here to get to my Bible okay now we're going to look at several scriptures that are used to prove the gap theory now we're going to be starting in Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 Genesis 1 1 and 2 says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. <clears throat> now, they're saying this is proof of the gap theory. Um, but let's summarize what's going on here. Let's start examining the scripture. It starts out with verse 1, a statement. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's verse 1. That's your summary statement. Remember, this was written by a Jew, Moses, and they write slightly differently. So what happens is he starts off with the summary statement. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, that's basically, bam, what happened. And then verse 2 onward is explaining the how of how God did that. Now, the gap theory goes on to say in verse 2 where it says and the earth was without form and void they say and should have been translated as the word but now this is once again where we apply hermeneutics and we look at grammar because ultimately it doesn't matter what science says we're laying aside for a minute and this is what I'm asking my my friends with the gap theory to do uh, who, who hold to the gap theory this is what I'm asking them to do because I have been demonized for rejecting the gap theory um, and when I try to discuss it on an intelligent level, biblically based, 
I'm said I'm basically told to forget that you need to look at the science. Well, no. Let's look at what the Bible itself says. Now, this was originally written in Hebrew. Now, Gesenius, he was a Hebrew scholar. He says of the of the word and, uh, which is the first word in verse two, he says it is the Hebrew word wa, w a w. He said it is not just a conjunction like the gap theorists say which would mean it could be translated as the word but but he says wa is copulative having the meaning of the old english phrase from the 16th 17th century to wit uh, meaning namely or that is to say um, so that's something that we have to take uh, Oh, look at this is not just a conjunction but this is a wa copulative um, people point out and that's the gap theory argument is wa is a conjunction but more than that Gesenius says it is a wa copulative so the word and holds up and that means that the translation is sound when it says and the earth was without form and void now here and this is my study from Dake when I read through and I read probably three quarters uh, when I went through like the third or fourth time of Dake's section on the dateless past and the gap theory it was when I started examining this when I started studying it all out, I made my way three quarters of the way through it and gave up. Because every argument hinges back, or it points back, and it hinges upon this. In verse 2, where it says, And the earth was without form and void. Everything hinges upon this word was. The gap theory, and those who hold to the gap theory say, This should have been translated, became. Now, Arthur Custance, and if you remember, I, I mentioned him, he claimed that out of 1,320 times the verb haya is used, only 24 times does it mean to be. Therefore, it should be translated as became. But here's the problem with this, and here's the refutation of that. Custance isolated one word and he assigned it a definition and a translation apart from the context and the syntax of the Hebrew. Now anyone who studied languages they'll tell you yes a word can have multiple definitions and true the word that is translated as was, it does and it can mean the word become or became. That's absolutely true. However, you do not just take a word and look at how you want to translate it. It is always the context and the syntax that demands the translation of a word and its definition. So this point that he had to isolate this one Hebrew word from the text to eliminate the context and the syntax to arrive at the translation of became, that's a clear-cut case of eisegesis because he's removing what you have to have to be able to accurately translate. That's one of the problems. Now I want to point something else out. I mentioned I had some other books here, and I'm going to go to one of them right now. And it is one that actually promotes the gap theory. Um, however, this book is a little bit more honest than most. This is a commentary I have, and I recommend this commentary to everyone because it's a very good, concise uh, commentary. As you can see, it's pretty thick as well. Um, this commentary is over 2,300 pages. Uh, it is the Believer's Bible Commentary by William MacDonald, edited by Art Farstad. This is published by Nelson, by the way. Now, I'm going to read 
the commentary from this for Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Now remember, this is one that promotes the gap theory. Well, let's see here. Verse 2. One of several conservative interpretations of the Genesis account of creation, the creation reconstruction view, says that but that's the gap theory, creation reconstruction view. They're trying to soften it up and, and call it something else so it, they don't have to use the word theory because if something is a theory, it's just not true. It's not proven. Uh, it's not that it's not true, it's just not proven. Um, anyway, one of the several conservative interpretations of the Genesis account of creation, the creation reconstruction view, says that between verses 1 and 2, a great catastrophe occurred. Perhaps the fall of Satan. Uh, see Ezekiel 28, 11 through 19. This caused God's original perfect creation to become, without form and void, tohu vavohu. Since God didn't create the earth waste and empty, see Isaiah 45, 18, only a mighty cataclysm could explain the chaotic condition of verse 2. Proponents of this view point out that the word translated hayetha, uh, translated was, which is the Hebrew word hayetha, could also be translated had become. Thus the earth had become waste and empty. Now what's really interesting is there's a end note there. Uh, a little number next to the word uh, or the phrase had become and it's assigned as number four so if we go to the end of the book of Genesis in this commentary what happens is we have that little note we have a response to it or not pardon me not a response but we have a little bit more of an exposition on something else they had to say so when we look at that fourth note because had become was the fourth note in the section. Here's the end note for note number four for Genesis chapter one, verse two. However, now remember, this is one promoting the gap theory, but listen to this, what this end note even says. And this is a, a brilliant stroke of honesty and I appreciate this. However, the Hebrew word hayah usually is followed by the preposition la when it means become. And that is not the case here. When this verb is followed with the word le, it means to become or became. And it even says right here in the text of the Hebrew, that is not the case. So here we have a pro-gap theory commentary in the end note, they show their honesty, and I deeply appreciate it. And it's one reason why I, I appreciate this commentary. They come right out and they say the grammar does not allow for the translation. I really, you have no idea how much I appreciate that. Let me put this commentary back up here. Ugh, okay. Now. I also want to read from another commentary, which I think is out of print. This is the New Layman's Bible Commentary. This was published by Zondervan back in like the 60s, 70s, 80s. This is tremendous. I originally got one for a dollar at a church rummage sale. Um, it's another one volume commentary. It's semi-technical, so it's a little bit more technical than the one I just put on the shelf. Um, this commentary was done by Howley Bruce and Ellison. And if you're wondering, Bruce, yes, it is FF Bruce. However, I want to go to what this semi technical commentary has to say. And there's several articles in this. Um, and I think the Genesis commentary was by H.L. Ellison. Let's see here. This is a very long section. Okay, here we go. Okay, I want to read a couple sections out of this. Creation. Does, and this once again... Okay, this is by H.L. Ellison for chapters 1 through 11. Okay, this is from the introduction to it. Does Genesis 1-2 indicate a reversion to chaos? 
The view often called the gap theory that Genesis 1-2 indicates a gap between God's original creation and the creating of what now is first became popular last century as an attempt to reconcile the view of a six-day creation and the existence of the fossils in the geological strata, which seem to suggest very long periods of time. Quite apart from intrinsic difficulties, and then there's a reference to seeing Bernard Ram, uh, he wrote a book on hermeneutics called Protestant Biblical Interpretation, I believe it was. Uh, anyway, quite apart from intrinsic difficulties, the Hebrew of 1-2 will not bear the meaning forced on it by this theory, see commentary, which we will. Today this view is being increasingly abandoned by those who wish to harmonize Genesis with the geological record in favor of the view that the strata and their fossils were laid down by the flood. Now this is what the commentary says on it. It has been argued by men of very different outlooks that we cannot conceive of the creation of chaos without form and void. Tohu vabohu. Appeal often being made to Isaiah 45 18. Many have used this argument to justify translating and the earth became without form and void, thus implying the destruction of the original creation. But this rendering flies in the face of Hebrew syntax. In fact, the use of chaos rather prejudges the argument. Um, so that's my New Layman's Bible commentary from Zondervan. I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's now completely out of print. But you can still find them for like a dollar or two on uh, Amazon. Uh, let's see here. Whoops, I dropped the book. Uh. So there you have two conservative commentaries, one of which promoting the gap theory, one of which opposing the gap theory. And even the one that promotes the gap theory in its honesty admits that the grammar of the Hebrew does not allow that translation. Now ultimately every argument I've heard goes back to or can be translated uh, can be traced back to Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. Even the scriptures I'd already mentioned from Isaiah 45 and and, and um, I think uh, one of the, in the other section of Isaiah even those rely completely upon or read information into Genesis 1-2. So really, ultimately, it's all about Genesis 1-2. But now we're going to look at some of those. It was Isaiah 34-11, Isaiah 45-18, and Jeremiah 4-23. Now here's the argument for tohu and bohu, or tohu va bohu. Isaiah 34.11 and Jeremiah 4.23 show this phrase is used to show the result of judgment causing destruction and that destruction causes things to be tohu wabohu, without form and void. But here's the thing, and this is where once again we apply hermeneutics. We look at the context, we check out the syntax, and we look and see, is this true? Once again, and here's the refutation of this, once again, check the context. The syntax demands translation and definition to be different and to mean different things in their contexts and syntaxes. The Jeremiah and Isaiah verses allude to the extent of future judgment being so bad it will be like the world before it was filled. This is what we call a verbal illusion, and a verbal illusion only works one way. In other words, here in these passages of Isaiah 34.11 and Jeremiah 4.23, where tohu vabohu appear, um, it's worded differently because the context and syntax demands a different translation. But what happens is this is an illusion back, and it's a parallelism is what it is. Um, it's a verbal illusion. It's alluding back to what the earth was like before it was filled as that's how severe God's judgment is going to be. Then if we look at Isaiah 45 18 it says God did not create the world in vain. 
Once again, when we check the context, this verse has nothing to do with the initial or original state of creation. It's relating the intent or purposes of God in creation. Now let's go ahead and take a quick look at that, Isaiah 45, 18. And this is one I'm just going to read, because I'm trying to keep this video a little shorter than I normally would. Okay, so instead of looking just at verse 18, we're going to start at verse 15 and read through verse 19. They shall be ashamed and also confounded, all of them. They shall go to confusion together that are makers of idols. But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded, world without end. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, Seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. The Lord that created the heavens, verse 18, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he has established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. This is saying, yes, when the earth was created, he then had to form it. He then had to fill it. That's essentially what this passage is saying. Um, So once again, this is not talking about creation itself. This is relating God's purposes in creation, that he created the world to be inhabited, to be filled. Um, nothing to do with the world having to be recreated because God destroyed it. Uh, then finally, from Genesis 1, and this is going to be the last section we look at from Genesis 1. In Genesis 1.28, God told Adam and Eve, go and replenish the earth. And they always look at this um, translation of replenish as truth. Because the word replenish, if you look it up in a modern dictionary, it means refill. However, if you go back to Webster's 1828 dictionary, which I happen to have on my phone, and I'll show you exactly what the word replenish means. In Webster's 1828 dictionary, replenish means to fill, to stock with numbers or abundance. The magazines are replenished with corn, the springs are replenished with water. Multiply and replenish the earth, Genesis 1. To finish, to complete. And then if it's used as a verb intransitive, it means to recover former fullness. But its primary use originally was to fill. It later dropped the meaning of fill, and it took the meaning of refill. The English language was a language that had to develop. All languages have to develop, and they all have to be able to change with time. And there's slight changes all the time. Just a hundred word, just a hundred years ago, the word "cool" uh, meant something of a low temperature. But today, it can mean something of a low temperature. It can mean um, someone who is very relaxed, or it can mean something that is beyond belief or amazing. It, it can be used as a phrase to show amazement. So that's just an example of how words do over time change their meanings originally in the 17th century when the King James was translated in 1611 the word replenish didn't mean to refill it just meant to fill and that Webster's 1828 dictionary bears out that there has been a change in its meaning um, so that's something else that we need to take into consideration in fact if we look let's see here we can find that note once again okay the Hebrew word for used there in 128 
for fill or refill, replenish, uh, is what I meant, fill or replenish, is the Greek, uh, pardon me, the Hebrew word uh, mele, and it means fill, not refill. So even if you go back, and that's the only way it can be translated, so even if you go back right there, back to the Hebrew, and there's no other way it can be translated, that's just what it means, fill. Right there, it refutes that whole idea, and that's another strong point that gap theorists use, is the word replenish. Okay, look at any other translation, and then ask the question, why is it translated differently? And then do some word studies, and do research into the English language, and do some looking into the Hebrew uh, grammar, and what you'll see is it doesn't bear out to refill, it means fill, replenish. Now, ultimately, the gap theory is an attack on a literal six-day creation. And it's saying that the Earth was actually recreated. And there's a whole argument there for uh, the word bara in Genesis 1, when it says God created the heavens and the Earth. Uh, they're saying there's a difference between bara and another word, uh, the word for make. And the problem there is that that doesn't bear out either because if you look at Hebrew grammars and Hebrew dictionaries, what you'll see is that these two different words are used interchangeably and they mean the same exact thing. Ultimately, this is an attack on the six-day literal creation of the earth. Does that bear it out? Is there any scriptures that specifically say the earth was created in six days yes this is not arguable this is not a matter of translation this is a matter of command did you know that the bible actually commands us that the earth was created in six days i'm serious if you look at the ten commandments in exodus chapter 20 what you'll see in verses 8 through 11 Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So even there in Exodus 20 in the Ten Commandments we are told that yes six literal days is the period of creation. And there we it said the, the Lord made the earth in those six days. So what ultimately does this say? This is used to, the gap theory is used oftentimes, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's used to fill in uh, for the millions of years science uses to show the Earth is that many years old. It's used to show an old Earth creation, I've heard that. Um, ultimately, it doesn't deal with any of the problems uh, that science has with the Bible. It just tries to explain them away. And explaining something away is not refuting it. Explaining it away is not giving a reasoned response. It's just ignoring the problem. And that's what the gap theory seeks to do, is just ignore the problem. Now, what supposedly happened during this time besides the fall of Satan? Well, supposedly, you know, the fossil record, there's dinosaurs, there's humans, there's a whole creation and then Satan fell and then God destroyed the earth with a flood or some other way. Uh, I've heard different arguments on that one. But anyway, then God had to recreate the earth after he killed off his original creation. There's a problem here. Go into your Bible, into the New Testament, in the book of Romans, and what we see in Romans, in verse 12... Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, 
for that all have sinned. Now, gap theorists at this point will say, well, this is regarding spiritual death. Well, I think it's regarding spiritual death, absolutely, but also it's regarding physical death. And at that point, they say, where's your evidence for that? Very simple. 1 Corinthians 15 demands it. So if you have your Bible still, we go into 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and really it's the whole chapter, but we're going to focus on just a couple verses. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 21, which parallels the death of Adam to the death of Christ. So did Christ die spiritually or did he die physically on that cross? Um, according to the entire New Testament record and even several passages of the Old Testament, Jesus Christ died physically on that cross. 15.21 says, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Um, so here we see that uh, the gappers are claiming Romans 5 only refers to spiritual death, but are disproven, especially when we see that in 1545 of 1 Corinthians that Adam is considered to be the first man. Uh, 1545 of 1 Corinthians says, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Wow, how amazing is that? So ultimately, the problem I have with the gap theory is that, number one, there's no grammatical evidence to support the idea of the gap theory. Number two, it does nothing for us theologically except for cause more problems and it causes us to be forced into using bad hermeneutics. Now, I may seem like I'm being a little bit mean in this, and I'm not trying to be, but this whole idea of a gap theory, there is no evidence for it from scripture. That's something I've seen repeatedly with those who believe in the gap theory. Well, what do you do about this? What do you do about that? Look, I'm not focusing on what science says. I'm focusing in on what scripture says, what scripture means. So instead of starting with the idea that science and scripture have to be on the same level and equal in authority, and that they have to agree with each other all the time, instead of that, let's say that we just examine what scripture says. We forget completely about science. We push science to the side. We look just at what scripture says. We see what scripture says. And then as Christians, we can form our worldview to exactly what it is that scripture says. If someone claims to be a Christian and they want to believe in the gap theory, that's fine. They, I would not doubt their salvation. I would doubt their ability to use proper hermeneutics, and I would doubt that they have scripture as their final and ultimate authority. I would say they don't probably believe in the Reformation doctrine of sola scriptura, that scripture alone is our highest and final authority. But I would not doubt their salvation, not by any means. However, when you start believing in the gap theory, you then have to start pulling scriptures out of their context. You have to start twisting the grammar, the syntax, the context. You have to do those things to support your theory. And the thing is, the theory holds no water. I would recommend you, I'm sure Answers in Genesis probably has some really good stuff on the gap theory. Um, probably a lot of the stuff I've covered already. Um, because some of this stuff is from notes I made years ago. But anyway, the gap theory, folks, it's just not biblical. Those who say it is biblical, all they have to do is twist the scripture to make it biblical. And that's ultimately what they've done. Um, I know there's a lot of people that believe in it. 
and it's mainly because they've gotten the Schofield Bible or the Dake Bible and they've elevated those notes to the same level as scripture. Um, there are those who have their superstar preachers. Um, I've heard um, many, many, many charismaniacs who use the Dake Bible promoting the gap theory. Perry Stone, I, I heard him doing it, and he comes right out and says he gets it from Dake, basically. Um, Benny Hinn, or as my one friend calls him, Benny the Hun. Um, and I've heard several others where they just come right out and they say, listen, I use the Dake Bible, and this is where I get it from, and this is what it means. Yet anytime you try to have them deal specifically with the text, they go back to that Aquinian philosophy birthed by Thomas Aquinas of, well, wait a minute, we have to take science into consideration when we're judging what the Bible says. No, you don't. You need to read the Bible. Take the Bible for what it says. And remember a principle of hermeneutics. Something is taught in every hermeneutic class I've ever seen. Or believed by every hermeneutics teacher. When the plain sense of a text makes sense, seek no other sense from the text. When you're looking at Genesis 1, 1 and 2, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. It's not saying that the, that the Lord created the earth in a state of chaos and confusion. No. It's saying ultimately he created the earth. And then in verses 2 onward, it explains the creation process. He created the heaven itself, the earth itself, and the earth at its initial creation was without form and void. And then it goes on to explain how God filled the earth and completed it and brought it to completion and fruition. That's all it's saying. So yes, once again, ultimately, every argument for the gap theory hinges strictly upon Hebrew, uh, Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. Ultimately it all hinges upon that. And the two main verses, the second most important one, tohu va bohu, without form and void. The, or, yeah, the third most important is the first word, wa. The second, tohu wa bohu, without form and void. Remember, wa meant but, without form and void. And the primary, the thing that it all hinges upon, that if you don't get this one right, it's just going to fall completely apart, is a single Hebrew word, was, which they have to translate as became. Because if they don't translate it as became, then Genesis 1-2 stands diametrically opposed to the gap theory, which it does. Now, I know I've probably angered quite a few people, and it's okay if you disagree with me. I still love you. Um, I'm not saying you're not a Christian because you believe in the gap theory. What I'm saying is you don't really study and practice good hermeneutics. Uh, and I'm not trying to sound mean or judgmental in that, but there is rules we follow in hermeneutics. It is a scientific process. You want to go to science? Go to the science of hermeneutics. Um, but hermeneutics is a scientific process. And we start with the Bible. We don't start with science and then read science into the Bible and then bring the gap theory out because we had to use science to interpret the Bible. We use a science, the science of hermeneutics, but we do not use secular geology and the fossil record and geologic strata to interpret creation. No. God created. That's just how it is. Now, I know I sound like really mean and harsh on this. I have been demonized by many people. I have been treated uh, absolutely horrible because I'm a young earth creationist. I believe in a literal six-day creation because it commands me to in the Ten Commandments. Uh, I believe that the earth is less than 10,000 years old. Uh, I believe the text of the Bible as it is, without science reinterpreting it for me, secular science reinterpreting it for me. I believe that like Jesus, we should practice exegesis 
as our hermeneutic practice. And I would encourage you to do the same. You know, there's some stuff out there about the gap theory. But you know what? For everything out there about the gap theory, it's all opinion. It's all questionable. That's why it's called a theory. Because if something is proven, it's no longer a theory. It's a law in science. So forget about theories. Go with facts. Look at a Hebrew grammar. Learn Biblical Hebrew, and what you'll see is exactly what I've been saying. You have to twist Scripture. You have to, to get the gap theory. Because unless you commit the sin of eisegesis, you will not come up with the gap theory from studying Scripture. So until next time, I'm Brother Chad with Master's Lanterns Ministries. I want to thank you for tuning in, and if you'd like to email us, our email address is masterslanterns at gmail.com. Our Facebook page, www.facebook.com slash masterslanternsministries. Until next time, I just want to thank you for tuning in and watching this. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to email us. And also, I'd just ask that the comments on the video stay respectable. Until next time, I'm Brother Chad. God bless, and keep up the fight for the faith. Bye.